Hacking is the most important skill set of the 21st century. It's influencing geopolitics, it's influencing cyber war, it's influencing cyber criminals, it's influencing espionage. I mean, you can just keep on going on and on and on. The guy who knows Linux in that in that particular institution is always the one that is the go-to guy. You're like, oh, he, this is the guy who knows Linux. It, it yep. shouldn't be a rare skill, but in no. some offices it is, and it'll assure your employment forever. <laughs> I'm just going to say this, Occupy the Web, what I really like about the way you teach this stuff is you teach it from a practical point of view rather than just someone saying, here's tail. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, this is where most people are going to use tail is reading log files. So if you're in cybersecurity, you got to keep track of those those log files. You got to see what's happening on your system. Hey everyone, it's David Bumble back with Occupy the Web. Occupy the Web, welcome. Thanks, David. It's always an honor to be back on the best IT and cybersecurity channel on YouTube. And before we start, I want to congratulate you on hitting 2 million subscribers. Good job. Yeah, that's that's quite an honor to be able to hit 2 million subscribers. So, I really appreciate it. And, you know, thanks so much for joining me on this journey. So many positive comments about the content that we create together. And that is what I really want to announce for everyone. So we started our series last time where we spoke about Linux basics for hackers. And Occupy the Web has agreed to continue the series. So this is his book. If you want to read it, see these videos as a companion guide and sort of an update to some of the information in the book. Occupy the Web is addressing a whole bunch of things. So, you know, go and buy the book, follow along on the videos or with the videos. Occupy the Web, I always enjoy talking to you because I always like to say, you know, you wrote this book as well, Network Basics for Hackers. You approach this kind of stuff from a hacker's mindset. And you've also got this book, Getting Started, Becoming a Master Hacker. You got to remind me again, are your books still killing it on Amazon, right? They're both doing well on Amazon. The Getting Started Becoming Master Hacker uh, has been the number one selling book on Amazon in last week. And the Network Basics for Hackers was the number one hacking book on Amazon. So it's they're both selling pretty well, I'm pleased to say. Uh, and of course, the Linux Basics for Hackers, even though it's five years old, is still the best selling Linux book on Amazon and other places. So I'm happy to see that. And I want to thank everybody for, you know, buying the books and uh, supporting this effort to bring cybersecurity training to everybody. So that all having been said, let's talk a little bit about Linux here. One of the things that makes Linux different than say Windows is that Linux was designed so that all the configuration that takes place in Linux is done via text files, okay? Everything's a file and configuration is all done through text files. So unlike Windows, when you want to configure something, you have to do a plugin, in MMC, what have you, and then go click, 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 click to be able to configure something in Windows. In Linux, it's really much simpler, is that all you need to do is to go to the configuration file, and the configuration files are almost always in Etsy, okay, in the Etsy directory. And then you open up that file in a text editor, and it, you know, we could go into, you know, VI or BIM or any of the others of the text editors, but you don't, you, you can use a simple graphical text editor, like what's built into Kali right now is Mousepad, and open up the file, edit the file, save it, and then you're done configuring. That's how configuration is done in Linux. So if we just quickly go to the Etsy directory and go ls-l, now mine might be a little bit different than yours because I've got stuff that you probably don't have, but these are almost all, you can see the comp files. In each one of these, like here's SQL map, and if I go to that directory, I'll find a comp file. Here's another comp file. These are all configuration files. So these configuration files, are they determine how the application actually works. And so in the book, I used Snort. Snort is, um, is a IDS, or a network intrusion detection system, that used to be built into Kali by default. But 
in the recent years, Kali has taken it out uh, of both the default installation and they've taken it out of the repository as well. And so I get people constantly writing me like every day about, I can't, I can't install Snort. Okay. So in the book, I tell you to go ahead and go suit. Let me clear my screen. And then I'm going to go back a level CD dot dot takes me back one level in my directory structure. And then notice that I'm at the very top of the file system at the root. Let's go to my home directory. I can use the tilde CD to the tilde and that'll take me now go PWD. It takes me to my home in Cali. The tilde represents my home directory of the user that I'm in here. Okay, so I can the shortcut is simply go CD tilde and that takes me to my home directory. Now, normally to get snort, we'd go sudo apt, okay, install. I think in the book I use apt get. Let's just talk about that, okay? You're gonna get people upset if you use apt get. Sorry, go on. Yeah, well, apt get was the older command. Now we're just using apt, all right? So in the book I use apt get, but you can use apt. Either both of them work. Right, so apt is just a little newer. So apt, okay, install snort. So it asked me for my calendar, my password. Notice that I use sudo. I don't use sudo in the book because it wasn't required back in the older Kali's. Sudo gives me root privileges for that single command. I put in my password and it goes through and it tells me snort is already the newest version, 2.91515. I've already have it installed here. And there's actually a newer version of Snort that's out. It's 3.0. And but this one works great. And that's what we're going to be working with. For those of you who are getting a message that says Snort is not available, package not found, let me show you what to do. So what we need to do is we're going to go sudo mouse pad. Okay. Etsy apt sources list. Okay. What this should be plural sources. What this is, is open it up and you'll see. This is a uh, configuration file, okay, essentially, for the app to, to where app, APT, where it goes to look for packages. Yours, okay, you can see I've got quite a few of them here. I've got some Parrot. I was going to say, um, yeah. nice. I got, I got some Parrot repositories down here, okay. So normally what happens is that when you have your um, Kali, you're going to have this line right here or something very similar to it. What I've done is that I have added some other sources. Let's see. This is one right here. Okay. Let's go ahead and this is the Debian. Just for people are not sure, what, is the, what did you do with the hash there? Oh, the hash is a comment. Okay. So it's commenting it out. Okay. These are... When you see these hashes here, that means it's commented out, all right? So I've commented, for, for whatever reason, I've commented out some of these here. Uh, in some cases, they'll throw error messages if the packet isn't available, what have you. So what, what I want you to do, everybody, if you want to use Snort on your system, is go ahead and add that line to this file, okay? This is simply the FTP Debian repository, and then go ahead and save it. And now when you do the apt install, it'll find Snort for you and it'll install 2.915, okay? That's the version that we want. And let me go ahead and close this mouse pad. If that doesn't work for you and there's a possibility that it doesn't, I've heard from a few people for whatever reason, it hasn't worked for them. There's another thing that you can do to follow along in these exercises. And let's let's do that. Let's go ahead and look at mouse pad and uh, let's go sudo mouse pad, sudo mouse pad, and just go to Etsy Apache. So in the chapter two, we're just, what I'm trying to show here is how you can use some basic text manipulation on configuration files. It doesn't matter demo, yeah. if it's it doesn't matter if it's Snort or if it's Apache. It just we're, we're just trying to learn some basic skills of how to manage these files. And so let's go ahead and open up this and you can see here that I have the Apache 2 configuration file. 
So if for whatever reason, and you're going through the book and you can't get Snort installed on your system, um, use this. Use, use the Apache too. We're trying to demonstrate a, a fundamental skill set. doesn't matter what file that you use. So um, Snort, I use Snort simply because it is a cybersecurity tool, right? It's been around for over 20 years. It's an excellent piece of software. It's now owned by Cisco. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an idea. So it's designed to detect intrusion. That's what it's, that's what it's you know, been put together for. And it's been around, I think, since 98, if I remember correctly. So it's been around quite a while. So in the book, we go ahead and we're going to look at, I'm going to go ahead and do these with the configuration file for Snort. But if you don't have Snort, you can't get Snort, feel free to just go ahead and do everything I'm doing with Apache2.com, the file I just showed you. Okay. So let's go. I like Snort. It's a good tool. Let's take a look at it. Let's go cat. We can do that. And Etsy, that's where the configuration mm -hmm. files are. Then the directory is snort. Okay, the subdirectory is snort. And then there's a file called snort conf. Okay. So just because just I'm slow, you're saying that if that doesn't work because I don't have snort, then I should just do exactly the same thing, but just substitute the snort command with like Apache, right? That's what you were saying, right? Ex exactly. Go use the Apache. It comes back and tells me, you, your permission's denied. There we go. Okay. And so when I use the, the sudo, I get it. It says basically when it comes back to this permission denied, you know, then that means you need to use sudo. Sometimes you'll try to open up or run a command and it'll say it can't find it. Sometimes it, it tries sudo. Okay. Sometimes it'll, it'll find it if you're using the root user. So here we go. Here's the file. We just catted it. Okay. Cat is a real simple text display command. And what cat does is it just takes the entire file and displays it on your screen. Yeah, that, that's okay for small files, but for big files, it, it doesn't work very well. All right. So we're going to look at other ways that we can go ahead and view the contents of the file that are more useful, have, you know, greater practical uses for us. One of those is simply to use the the command head, all right, and same file, okay. Oh, I should tab. Let me tab. Snort <laughs> 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 uh, comp. All right, I, I end up typing. Let's go ahead and permission denied again. So you know, don't don't fret. Just go ahead and put in the sudo. All right. And what this will do is head will now give me the first, I think the default is 10 lines, right? The first 10 lines, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Yeah. It gives me the first 10 lines by default. But if I needed more than 10 lines, I could easily just tell it to give me more. I can say, give me the first 20 lines. Let's right, And it'll go ahead and give me the first 20 lines or... 100 lines or 92 lines, <laughs> all right? Whatever, whatever the amount of lines that you want, okay? So this gives me the first 10 lines or whatever specified number I want, but I can also look at the bottom of the file, okay? Sometimes I want to see the bottom of the file because some files like log files, log files are always being appended. They're being appended. They're being added to at the bottom of the file. So the top of the file is old stuff. The bottom of the file is the new stuff. That's the stuff I'm interested in seeing. So in that case, I can go ahead and use the keyword, I'm going to go sudo, tail, okay? I'm just going to say this, Occupy the Web, what I really like about the way you teach this stuff, and I think you know the viewers agree with us, is you teach it from a practical point of view rather than just someone saying, here's tail. It gives us the last 10 lines. You've actually given us a really good example of why you'd use it. So thanks. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, this is where most people are going to use tail is reading log files. So if you're in you know, cybersecurity, you got to keep track of those those log files. You got to see what's happening on your system, and so this is a way that we can use this. Go look at the last ten lines and see what's happened in your log files. And in the case of Snort, there's our our last ten lines. When we get into looking at the logs, I don't know what chapter we. I actually have a chapter on logs in 
logging systems chapter 11. So we'll get into that. We'll look, we'll use the tail command for checking the logs. But here we're just going to stay with our Snort or Apache 2. If that's what you're using, that's fine. You don't need to be Snort. It doesn't really matter what, what file you're using. I'm trying to teach fundamentals of how to find and view the files. We use tail and its default is 10 lines. We can obviously, just like with head, we can go ahead and use 20. And it'll show us the last 20 lines of the snort configuration file. We can also, oftentimes, we want to go ahead and see the file with line numbers on it. And so we can do that by going NL, okay? And same thing, Etsy snort, snort, comp, like that. And now it gives us line numbers, right? So we can go ahead and find exactly what line we want to see, right? And, uh, and go back, if we would need to edit it, we know what line to go back to. One of the things that is probably one of the most fundamental skills in Linux is using grep to find the material that you're looking for. In, in the snort file, there's a section called the output. And if we were to sc scroll up through all these 600 lines, we would find that there's an output section and that section is one that if you're really going to use it in a commercial environment, you need to configure. And that's why I use it as an example, because that's where you're going to need to, to work at in Snort to get it set up in your commercial environment. So let's go ahead and do the same thing. Let's use, let's use our cat instead of NL. We could use NL as well. And then what we can do with this is that we can go and filter it. So the, this is a pipe right here. Pipe says, send the output of this command, the output of this command to a new command. And that new command is going to be grep. Grep is a filter. And then say we're looking for the output section of the snort configuration file. It'll do is it'll go ahead to each line and look for the word output. And if it finds that word, it'll display it on the screen for me. Let's do that. Well, there we go. And puts it in red. Even easier. All right. So it's showing me all of the output lines. These are where I determine in Snort where the alerts or the logs are going to go to. You can see here, here's the alert unified, alert unified 2. There's several of these. It's sending, in this case, it's sending out to the Snort log. Here, it's sending out to the merge log. You can see that this one is actually commented out, and this is the default. It's sending out your uh, logs to snort log, all right? This is one of the key components of setting up your snort to be functional in a commercial environment, wherever, you know, whatever, a production environment rather than a commercial environment, because it might not be commercial. In a production environment, you got to tell it, where are you going to send the data too, the, the data about malicious activity. And this is the section. Sorry, so I'll just try and ask the questions that I, I'm assuming a lot of people are gonna ask. After your cat, you've got two spaces. Does spacing matter? Because it seemed to work without a problem, right? Yeah, it's, I could take the, that's just my poor typing skills, but uh, I no, could just, take- No, just, you know, some head. people might be used to like some programming language like Python or whatever might be, you know, spaces are important or some other exactly. languages. In Py in, in Python, that indentation becomes crucial, right? And so in here, it, it's not really in, this is our bash show, okay? It doesn't really make a whole lot of difference. You know, thinking about uh, this being a bash show, there's one of the things that has happened with the 2023 is that they've switched it over to a Z show, okay? So if you're using a brand new version, of uh, Kali, you're going to be working in a Z shell, which is the same shell. This is this is essentially a shell here, the same shell that a Mac OS uses. Most distributions of Linux and Unix use a Bash shell. You know, I I don't want to fight the tide, <laughs> but but I like the Bash shell. 
And and I would say 95% of people who work in Linux like the Bash shell and prefer the Bash shell. One of the things that in the newer versions, and this is an older version, right? There's a, a command called Kali Tweaks. Let's see if it works. This is a 2022 version, okay? There it is, Kali Tweaks, okay? So this is one of the things that, that is not in my book because it wasn't there back then. We can tell Kali what shell and prompt, among other things. You can see there's network repositories right here. There's meta packages here, and you know that's all good, but that's beyond what we're doing right now. We're just in the chapter two of of our book. It says shell configure the shell and command prompt. I'm going to hit enter, and it says configure the default login shell right here. Set the default login shell, and those are the two choices. I can either choose the bash or the z shell. I would suggest switching to the Bash show. <laughs> especially when they're following our I've videos, right? Yeah. Right, especially you're following this video, because some of the things in the Z shell are not exactly the same. Most of it's the same, but some of the things are not. And that's going to cause some things to break for you, if a few things to break for you. They're going to maybe be frustrating to a beginner. The other reason is that if you're working out in a, in a production environment, most people are using the Bash shell. They are not using the Z shell. So I have some uh, problems with offensive security switching over to the Z shell. But the beauty of what they've done is they've allowed us to switch back, right? So if you're using the Z shell, you can switch back to the born shell, okay, born again shell. <laughs> and go ahead and use it, which is you're going to find it on the Born Again shell on Red Hat. You're going to find it on Fedora. You're going to find it on on uh, Ubuntu. You're going to find it. Yeah, you know, just keep on going. If you're using Solaris, if you're using HPUX, you're going to find the Born shell. So it's probably a good idea to work with the Born shell so that you can go into other. Uh, Linux environments or Unix environments using the default shell that everybody uses. Now, as I said, Apple uses the Z shell. Kali, the new Kali has used the Z shell. You know, you, you might want to go ahead and use it. I'm not, I'm not saying that the Bash shell is better. What I'm saying is it's what I'm accustomed to, and it's what over 90% of Linux administrators are using. And maybe eventually Z shell will become um, will become the standard. But right now it's you know I just kind of I use the escape key to exit the Kali tweaks. So that's a that's not in the book. So you know if you want to make some changes, it's kind of a nice thing that they've added in the recent versions is Kali tweaks. I think it first went in in twenty twenty two, but I couldn't say that for certain. I think so. So we used the grep command, right? And we can also, oh, there's, you know, one of the things that we can do is that we can actually specify uh, what line we want to see. But that's what's probably more important is, and you see that in the book, around page 23 of the book, is the sed command, okay? S-E-D. All right, let's go ahead and just take a look at that command, S-E-D. All right, here's the S-E-D command. I just went ahead and entered it. And SED st stands for stream editor. Almost all of these commands are shortened versions of words. Okay. Stream editor is said, so it's not as mysterious as it might seem. And what we're going to be doing is editing a stream, right? That's what it's doing. This is the help screen, right? There's a lot of stuff here, but we're going to just be using some of the basic stuff, right? That we can do. Remember, let's go back and use our cat. All right, let's go sudo cat. All right, and then we're going to go etsy snort. And we're going to look at that snort config configuration. The oftentimes, most times in Linux, the configuration files end in c o n f, but not always. Sometimes you'll see them. C and F. Sometimes you'll see them as C F G. Sometimes you'll see the whole word spelled out. Okay, but most of them are C O N F. So let's go ahead and go back to that. And but let's grep 
looking for, once again, talking about the output from Snort, right? Let me go MySQL. I'm going to remind the viewers that if you don't have Snort, you can still do this with the Apache 2, and that works just fine, okay? So when I did the grep, I can see that there's two rules, okay, that have MySQL in them, all right? And if I wanted to go ahead and change those two, there's only two places that that word shows up, okay? Remember that in Linux, everything is a, yes, everything's text, text, yes, case sensitive, <laughs> case sensitive. So if you just, if you, you might want to go and take a look around and see, oh, you know, maybe somebody spelled it as, no, they didn't do that. So you need to be able to make certain that it's not using some other um, case than what you've put, written it in, because it won't find, you know, if it's written like this, it won't find it. Now that we know where MySQL is, and, and these are actually rules that are, have been written to be able to detect any kind of intrusion against a MySQL database. So Snort is a signature-based IDS. That means that it's taken what is referred to as a signature. It found a key element in the attack, a unique and key element in the attack, and it has taken that and built a rule looking for that from any of the packets that are coming across the stream of packets to your network, right? And we could go ahead and, and look inside these, but you know that's getting into a, a snort class versus <laughs> simply we'll do that simply a Linux. Yeah, we can do a snort class in a in the future. That's what it's doing here. It's just going ahead and looking for snort based attacks. Now maybe. Okay, we want to go ahead and edit that particular file okay, and replace the lowercase MySQL with maybe an uppercase or a different, a different way of expressing MySQL, kind of like this here or the capital M and then the uppercase SQL. The stream editor allows us to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and clear my screen. What this is useful for is that say you've written a script or other file, even a text file, okay, let's say you're writing a note to somebody or a letter to somebody, and you realize that you had misspelled this word over and over and over again, okay, and that rather than going through and finding each of them, you want to change all of them at one time. That's what this can do for us in any kind of text file. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to edit. So because that file is protected, okay, we need to use sudo. It's protected so only the root user can use it. So then we're going to go and use the sed command, okay, and go sed, and then s, and then it says, go ahead and find all of the occurrences of MySQL and replace it. This is what I do in the book, okay, so this is exactly in the book with G. Now, if you're using the Apache, you can find a different word and, and change it as well. Okay. So it says, go ahead and replace this word right here with this word here globally. That's what the G stands for. So S, S is like source and G is global, right? Yes, exactly. S is source, G is global. And then I have to give it the file that I want it to work on. Okay. And that's going to be, we're going to give it the, 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 the full path right, to that file, which is going to be Etsy, snort, snort, cow, make it simple, okay? And then we're going to send the output, and this is the output by using the, the greater than sign. That says take whatever I've done here and put it into a new file, right? The reason we want to make sure that we send this another file is because if we don't do that, the configuration file is when you run snort is going to be looking for snort conf and these kind of changes are may may not be in the best interest of your snort installation <laughs> so what we're doing here is we're getting root permissions using the stream editor using s as a source and then changing it here globally in the file so every time it sees it 
And we're doing it, this is what we're working on, and then we're sending it out to snort to comp. Okay, so let's go ahead and hit enter, and it goes ahead and changes that. Now, we could go ahead and go cat snort comp. Now, notice that this is snort to comp. This is in a different directory, and there's our file, right? Now, we can go ahead and cat and then go grep, okay, my SQL on that same file, and it comes back with nothing. Why? Because we changed every occurrence globally of my SQL. So let's go ahead and look for the way that we retyped it with a capital M and a capital. By the way, MySQL, for those who aren't familiar, is an open source database. It's used in millions of applications and websites. You know, it, it, it was very timely, a, a, a a couple of Swede developers came out with it in the mid 90s. And just as the internet was exploding and it was free. And so it's behind millions and millions of websites because it was free at the right time. Eventually, now it's owned by Oracle. And those same Swede developers have come up with a alternative that's called Maria. So if you're using your Kali, and you're trying to use MySQL and it says Maria, basically think of them as the same, right? They're basically clones of each other, the same developers. The reason they developed a new Maria was to prevent the possibility that Oracle, which is a commercial company, would make it not open source. So they came up with Maria, and that's what Kali is using now. So anyways, MySQL, grep, MySQL, and there they are. We've made those changes. Okay, so this is really That's kind of like finding and replacing Word or something, right? Yeah, it's kind of like finding and replacing Word, exactly. Except it's actually simpler and easier to, to do with uh, the said command. And that, so, yeah, in, in Word, you can go ahead and find, and then finds each one of the occurrences, and we'll change it. Same thing here. Now, we've been using some pretty rudimentary file display utilities, cat being one of them, NL, tail, head, okay? But there are some little more sophisticated ones, and one of those is going to be more. I'm going to go ahead and clear my screen so you can take it up to the top here. More is a text display command, but it's a little bit more sophisticated than cat. And let's go see, try it on our snort again. Snort comp. This is the old one. This is the original. I didn't change the original. Permission denied. Oh, Got to go and use my sudo. All right, there it is. Notice that unlike cat, it didn't scroll to the very bottom of the, the file. What it did is it stopped as soon as it filled up the screen, and then I can do enter to navigate down through the file. It's a little more helpful, a little more practical than cat is... Okay, cat, cat, by the way, stands for, it's short for concatenate, which literally is a fancy word for putting things, putting words together. That's what concatenate means. So if you ever wondered why they called the, the, the editor, not the editor, but the display command cat, it's just short for concatenate, a Latinate word that means putting things together, putting words together. You press, our, you're pressing enter, right? So it's one line at a time. I'm just, right? I'm just pressing enter, right? And it gives me one line at a, screen, at a time, okay? So I can go through my file looking for... Does spacebar work for a, like a whole page? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Your spacebar, okay, going through it, yep. Now, one of the things that we need to understand about more is to exit more, we need to use the Q, okay? So Q takes me out, all right? Not exit, not escape, it's going to be Q. Now, one of the things I showed you in the last class was the man page, All right? Man, okay, air, crack. We use air crack NG, I think, in the example. By using man, it's going to bring up the manual for whatever command I'm looking for. But one of the things that, reason I bring it up now is that the man is using more, okay, as its text display. So it uses a Q as well, all right? So if you get 
if you're in this manual and you can't figure out how to get out of it, know that it's simply a more command that uses the cue to exit. Right? Now, there's kind of a, an old saying in among Linux geeks that uh, less is more, right? Because less is a, another text display command that does more than more does. That's, that's the joke, okay? So if we go sudo, not a very funny joke, but it's a joke, okay? It's one of among our dad jokes. Linux, we showing our age. It's one, it's, it's one, of those, one of those Linux geek jokes that Linux geeks would find funny, but nobody else would. All right, so, so we're going to go sudo, and we're going to go less, and go etsy snort, and then snort conf. This is, this is less. All right, there we go. Now, one of the things that makes, uh, makes it different is that at the very bottom of the screen, you'll see that there's the highlighted path right here to the file, okay? If you press the forward key, okay, Less will let you search, all right? So I hit the, the forward slash, and it'll let me now search. When you say forward, and that's like I, right arrow, right? No, I hit the forward slash. Oh, forward slash, sorry, sorry. All right, forward slash key, I'm sorry. Now it'll let me go ahead and search. So now, remember that we, we knew that there's MySQL somewhere in this file. So we will allow us to go, and rather than uh, having to, to use grep or some other tool, we can go, and there it goes. It finds It finds it right there in the rules, and then I can keep on going, and I found it again, all right? So this is this is the less command, all That's right? Nice. So this allows us primarily to be able to uh, do searches on text files to find unique strings. Strings are basically letters. It's, it's one of those terms that if you're not been around the IT world, when people talk about strings, all strings are is text, right? A bunch of letters together, as opposed to, say, special characters or numbers or binary. Strings are text, right? So in this case, it allows me to search for strings or text. And when you get into certain areas of, say, like reverse engineering or analyzing malware, strings can be useful. There's a command in Linux called strings, right? That allows you to pull the strings out of, say, a piece of malware or any piece of software, right? So that's a term that you should know. Strings means just text, right? Then we can go ahead and use the queue and it takes me back, takes me out. Just like more, the queue does the same job of getting me out of that application. In this case, it's less. And I think with that, we have just concluded chapter two. I love it. I mean, just at the top of this recording, it was announced today that Cisco have purchased Splunk. I mean, big moves in the industry. Uh, I think you've said many times, hacking is the number one skill, right? Hacking is the most important skill of the 21st century, at least at this end of the 21st century. What are we in 2023? You know, maybe in 2090, which I won't be around to see, uh, maybe in 2090, uh, something else will have replaced it. But right now, I would say that hacking is the most important skill set of the 21st century. It's influencing geopolitics. It's influencing cyber war. It's influencing cyber criminals. It's influencing espionage. I mean, you can just keep on going on and on and on about how important it is. And most people only see hacking from the perspective of cyber crime, but it's influencing everything right now. And of course, cybersecurity is the other end of being able to prevent those types of attacks or repel those attacks. And at Hackers Arise, what we try to do is that we try to develop what we call cyber warriors who are neither attackers or defenders exclusively. We try to teach both offense and defense and, and turn out well-rounded cyber warriors who can both repel attacks and implement attacks, initiate attacks. And I firmly believe that if you want to be on the defensive side of cybersecurity, 
which by the way, I think Splunk is an excellent tool. And it's one of the things that we teach at Hackers Rise. We have a class on Splunk and we think Splunk, I think Splunk is an excellent tool. So um, I'm happy to see Cisco purchase it. And now Cisco has two of my favorite tools, Snort and Splunk. But we try to turn out well-rounded cyber warriors who can work on both sides, both offense and defense. And I think that by doing that, by taking that approach, you're better at what you do if you can see it from both the offense and defense perspective. I think that yeah. defensive cybersecurity defensive professionals who don't understand how to hack are going to not be as effective as they, if they actually knew how to hack. And same goes for offensive. They, you have to know what the defenses are up against that you're up against to be able to get past them. So that's what, that's our philosophy at Hackers Rise is to turn out both with people with skills in both areas, both sides of the aisle. And we think that this is the most important skill set in the 21st century, at least in 2023. In the first first 23 years of this century. And I love it, you know, the um, you've said it as well, you can't be a hacker without Linux. And um, that's why you wrote this book, right? And we're gonna continue talking, we're in chapter two now, I believe, is that right? Yeah, we're gonna go on chapter two. Yeah, I firmly believe that if you're, if you're not, uh, not using Linux, you're not a hacker. Yeah. And I'm surprised oftentimes how people will object to that statement, but it's true. And I have no, no qualms about saying it over and over again. I know that there are some hacker programs out there that teach hacking without Linux, but you're not a hacker when you come out of those schools if, you, if you're not being taught on Linux and taught using Linux. I, I gave a lecture at a uni major university about a year ago, and I said just this, and it turns out that the professor who was teaching the class taught it from Windows. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. And, and, so, and so the students, I'm saying this about, you got to know Linux, you're not really a hacker. And the students were laughing in the lecture hall because, you know, I can't see them, but I can hear them. And I'm like, I wonder why they're laughing. And later on, I learned that he had been teaching the class from a, in a university, a major university in the U.S. He'd been teaching hacking using Windows. And that's, that's, crazy. Not re that's not real, okay? And it's a disservice to those people, those students, to have him teaching from a Windows perspective because, you know, no hacker uses Windows. <laughs> I could say that. I could say no real hacker uses Windows. So anyways, let's you know, get I'll, I'll, I'll just chat. say this before we jump in. I mean, hey. Linux is, is a foundational skill for hacking, just for anything really these days. You have to know Linux if you want to be in IT. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on this. Um, I but I don't, I don't want to keep I you think, back. Sorry, go on. No, no, I think I agree with you that no matter what you're doing in, in IT, that I think you need to know you need to know Linux, right? And, and and you'll find that in the workplace that the guy who knows Linux in that in that particular institution is always the one that is the go-to guy. Like, oh, he's, this is the guy who knows Linux. It, it shouldn't be a rare skill, but in some offices it is, and it'll assure your employment forever <laughs> if you know Linux well, because there's still not enough Linux people. And no matter what you're working in, if you know Linux, it's going to make you more valuable to the organization. So take the time, learn Linux. My book was designed for people who want to enter cybersecurity, but don't have the Linux skills. It was designed from my experience of teaching cybersecurity and hacking to people who are really smart people, but had no Linux skills. And so I had to start on day one of teaching them Linux. And so the book grows out of that experience of training uh, hackers for the military who had no Linux experience. And it is clear to me from that experience that a book like this would be really useful and yeah. it's proven to be very useful. And I purposely kept it small. So those people who say, oh, you know, it doesn't have much depth. Well, it doesn't have much depth. That's It's meant to boil down the essentials for you so you can read the entire book. It's to make it accessible to everybody. And 
one of the things, the feedbacks I get from people is like, you know, it's the only Linux book I ever read the entire exactly. book, right? Exactly. <laughs> because all the other Linux books are like a thousand pages and they're so dense and deep and they have a lot of information, but those are books that you keep on the shelf and you reference them. This book is a book that you read and you go through the entire book. And when you come through the entire book, you'll have the fundamental skills that you need to operate in cybersecurity. You're not going to be necessarily a Linux expert, but you'll have the fundamental skills and then you can build upon that. Occupy the Webboard, I really like about what you've done here is, you know, we, we've spoken offline. You can go into the depths of these tools, right? But you're keeping it simple. I'm trying to keep it simple. That's the whole point of the book. And the whole idea was to keep the book very small, short, and accessible. So yes, you can spend, you know, more time to get to know these commands in greater depth. What I try to do is to boil it down to the essentials of what you need to be functional in Linux. So my dad joked, less is more once again, right? Less is more. <laughs> so for everyone who's watching, you know, please put your comments below, stuff that you want to cover or want us to cover. It's fantastic to be able to get input from Occupy the Web. And Occupy the Web, I'll, I'll say this again. What I really love about what you've done is you've got all this knowledge, but you bring it down to our level. So thanks so much for making it simple and keeping it, you know, short and simple. I always talk about the curse of knowledge. People who know a lot often forget that people who start don't and they're complicated. So thanks for keeping it simple. Well, I enjoyed doing this and uh, hopefully, you know, some of the things that we're adding to this video help people who are reading the book yeah. where things are a little bit different than what they are in the book. So hopefully this kind of brings things up to date and explains why, for instance, you can't do snort because you're, it's not in the repository, but you can add the repository in. And if that doesn't work, you can still just use Apache or any other file to do what we're doing to get to learn how to manipulate text in Linux. Okay, by the way, thanks so much. And I look forward to our next one. We're going to continue with chapter three next time, right? Analyzing and managing networks. So I'm looking forward to that one. Oh, yeah, that should be a good one. So that's an important one for those people who are working in cybersecurity to be able to understand how to use Linux in a networked environment. Thanks for having me, David. See you soon. See you soon. Look forward to it.